everybody. Welcome to our episodes on Little Women. This will be part two. If you're new here, welcome. If you're joining us again, also welcome. We're so happy to have you. This is part two and we will be mostly focusing on characters. So if you're interested in a deep dive into possible different readings of the beloved March sisters, Marmy and End March, enjoy. going to talk about one of the most compelling parts of the story, which is the characters. I told Lily about me talking to my friend Shop about that this is actually a book that her mom read to her when she was a kid. Yeah. And I thought it's really interesting that she preferred the 90s version, but that what spoke to her when her mother read these books to her, her or was the, the different sisters. And so we wanted to dive yeah. into... What do they mean? What's the significance of the sisters? Yes. Yeah. In asking this question of why this story keeps being remade, I think that's a really good point. The sisters are a huge pull as part of the story's popularity. I think they're the main reason why people really like this story is because you get to see these really well-developed female characters interacting and growing up, having to overcome obstacles, but always having that sisterly bond. So yeah, I think it's interesting because I found, sorry, this is to go off on a bit of a tangent, but go, go, go. I didn't. I definitely didn't hate the 90s version. I thought it was good. <laughs> I enjoyed it. But I don't think I really want to watch it again. I, wow. I did find elements of it slightly boring. Wow. But I don't... I'm really... Because I know this film is so beloved. I don't want to... I'm sorry, everyone who... I'm sure if I'd grown up watching this film, I'd probably be like, you know, this is amazing. It's my favourite thing. I think I just don't like period dramas that much. I still really, really like the 2019 version. But... I think it's interesting that Sharp didn't think that the sisters were that well realised in the 2019 version, because I really like their characterizations. And in the Bro de Chanel video about Greta Gerwig and the Universal Girl figure, it's one of the things that she pulls up as well as how the 2019 Little Women pulls out these kind of idiosyncrasies within the characters that makes them feel really fleshed out and alive, which I'm like, yeah, I agree with that. But fair enough, preferring the 90s version. We're going to go into this on the different sisters, I would say. But that's the thing about the different adaptations that I love. The different adaptations all do the sisters really, some sisters really well and some really badly. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go true. more into this later. But now I really want to force you to watch the three-parter because I really want you to tell me what you think about that one. Wait, which one? The, the, the miniseries? Yeah, the Maya Hawk I'll one. watch it. I will watch it. Because, I mean, first of all, blasphemy for saying that about the 90s version. And yeah, this is before streaming internet stuff was as available as it is now. That's all we had. That's all we had, Lily. We didn't have anything else. And it's not bad. It's not... I'm objectively, I'm like, this isn't bad. I just don't love... <sighs> I don't know. I mean, yeah. you and I have talked about this many times. Certain movies you should really watch when you're a child and certain movies you should really watch when you're a teenager because falling in love with it later on is a little bit harder to overlook yeah. certain flaws. I don't see flaws in the 90s one. I love it so much. I think it's so darling and it really makes me really happy every time I watch it. But I think it's interesting because all these different characters, one of the things that always sort of it gets compared to when people talk about the different March sisters is that you can sort of we also talked about this a little bit with boy bands, but there it's more which of one of the boys would be your partner if... Yeah. But with the March sisters, which one are you? Are you a Joe? Are you a... We also talked about this when we talked about Bob's Burgers and My Little Pony. Like, they have different personalities because they're meant to have different... Yeah, it's more... Co Maybe, again, this is one of the reasons why people like the story so much, but I hadn't thought about it as much in terms of, you know, the reason that you have... There's this boy band member and there's this one is that it's more marketable. It's yeah. to do with consumability, the consumption, and to kind of like promote this thing as a product and i wonder if maybe that's also one of the reasons why little women like specifically that thing each sister is like slightly different which one are you most like maybe that's also kind of to do with the success of little women yeah. but then again i kind of feel like everyone's just like i'm joe though everyone's just like but i love joe i mean it's also aspirational isn't it sorry for being a harry potter again but no one wants to be a hufflepuff when you're a child i mean yeah fuck transphobia that's not what i'm saying i want to make it very clear i'm not supporting any of that crap but yeah, you want absolutely. to be i'm trying to think of a different ip what was that stuff called i don't know why i remember that it was called dauntless but it was one of the groups that you could join in that dystopian book and movie series oh, what? with divergent 
I think Is so. Is it Divergent? I think yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dauntless was the kind of Gryffindor of... Yeah. You want to be the ones that do stuff, is what I'm saying. You want to be the mm. brave one. You want to be adventurous, right? You want to be... Joe, you want to be running around and doing stuff. And You want to be the main character, the main character house. Yeah, but the active one, yeah. It's sort of like Joe is the idealized version of like the bookworm, but she's also headstrong, knows her own mind, but she's also kind of one of the heads of the family and very intelligent and knows what she wants out of life. Do you know what else? So many stories that are written for young women are also about having a love story where the boy doesn't love you back and it's super tragic and he then falls in love with your best friend. The fact that in the story you get the option, if you self-insert as Joe, to turn him down. <laughs> mm. I feel that's also maybe a little bit satisfying. It didn't feel that way when I read it as a kid because I just remember being so annoyed by Lori in the book. But mm, uh, yeah. But I imagine that's also maybe part of the pull where you're not just a girl in a story where the boy then, I mean, does end up marrying your sister, but you still have an option first to turn him down. That gives you more agency than other stories would give you, I imagine. Yes. So yeah. with that, that's let's maybe start with... Joe. So what would you say makes Joe an interesting character? <laughs> All of those things we've just talked about. Yeah. But I think, again, we've this earlier, um, or in the previous episode, as it will now be, um, but we've referenced the fact that Joe is seen as almost a self-insert for Alcott herself and the autobiographical readings of Joe, and how that influences the fact that there are so many different ways of interpreting Joe, and so many people have interpreted her in different ways. Yeah. Specifically around queer readings of Joe. The fact that she fam- like turns down Laurie and then the controversy around her and Bear and her adamancy that she doesn't want to get married has led to especially lesbian readings of Joe, but also trans readings of Joe and ace readings of Joe as well. Which I've seen the least amount was the ace reading, which I think is something that is very underexplored. Yeah, um, we'll link these below, but I remember reading a Them article and then recently I also read a BuzzFeed article, like both of them about the queerness of Joe March in the books and then in the 2019 version specifically responding to that and how it's brought out these different elements. But there's queer readings of Joe, and then all of them are sort of like, oh, she's gay, which that's a very valid reading. She's sort of very tomboyish. She rejects Laurie. She has this in the BuzzFeed one that I was reading. They point to the fact that when she's like, oh, I'm sick and tired of people just thinking that love is all the woman is good for, but I'm so lonely. And that amazing, like really great speech that she mm-hmm. gives. Um, as an indication of her still wanting romantic love, but that it just because it's Laurie or with men, that doesn't work. And that she's actually after like romantic love, but like with a woman, and that's their interpretation of it, which is a very valid interpretation. But yeah, there are no ace readings of Joe, which I think is very, very few of them, which I feel is a very missed opportunity, very missed reading. And also the line, I care more to be loved, which she says to her mom, right? Yeah. I think that speaks yeah. a lot to maternormativity, like... Again, heteronormativity is the idea that we just assume everyone in society is heterosexual and everything's sort of shaped around this idea that everyone just is heterosexual and obviously cisgender heterosexual and heteronormativity assumes that everyone is just built for falling in love and having sexual desire the way that allosexual people just do and completely ignoring asexuality and all of the different identities that exist within asexual identity. And when I now rewatched it, when she says the line, I care more to be loved, I think that also can be very well read as an ace identity uh, notion in that sense, because she said, talks about, again, love as being something that I feel a lot of asexual people experience and a romantic people experience as something that you have an expectation of this happening because of all the stories you've read, of all the books that you've read and I mean, not in 1860, but all of the movies you've seen. <laughs> not so much in the 19th century. But um, <laughs> you have an expectation to be loved, maybe more so than yeah. fall in love. And you're like, I bet this is what that feels like. I think this is what I'm experiencing. And then it takes a lot of work to pull yourself out of that and be like, no, I'm I'm just not built that way. Whenever people say queer readings, they only ever see maybe possible bisexuality or having this character be a lesbian character. Which again, like you said, nothing wrong with that. I'm absolutely not disagreeing with any of that, but I just feel really reductive that it never goes into... It goes a little bit into the trans reading sometimes, which I like. Because in the 90s version, when she spots Lori for the first time, uh, Joe goes, if I were a boy, I want to look just like that. So the gender envy she experiences from seeing Laurie. 
And I think you wrote this down. You have a lot of swapping of clothes with Laurie in the 2019 version. But the ace thing really gets completely ignored in a lot of interpretations and readings of the story. And I think that that is something that would be really nice to see maybe in the future. Yeah, in that, the part that I referenced earlier, the her speech about, you know, but I'm so lonely. Mm-hmm. I think, because I read that as what you were saying about kind of desiring some a- aspects of the society she's rejecting. Mm-hmm. She's having this moment of doubt. It's kind of like what we talked about with passing, about society's expectations of love and what she should be doing. And she's like, I was so sure about this thing, this wasn't yeah. right for me. But now I'm having all these doubts because I just feel like this is what everybody expects. When she has that conversation, Laurie proposes, if you don't love me, then why does everybody expect this to happen? Why does oh, everyone be expected by your parents? Nice. Why does everyone expect yes. us to get together? And she's like, well, no. Why does everyone expect it though? <laughs> Yeah, then why does everyone expect it? And she's like, and then she's come to this point where, you know, she's at a really low moment. Everything's sort of, Beth has died. And we're going to talk a bit more later about how Beth is almost queer solidarity figure with her. It's like Mm -hmm. neither of them desire marriage. They have each other. They're both really close. But now Beth is gone. She's like, maybe I did make a mistake. I'm so lonely. I've gone off into the world away from my home been on my own it's re- i'm i'm lonely i come home my family isn't the same amy is away beth isn't here anymore my mother's yeah of course she's gonna have this moment of doubt of course and you know meg is off with her husband as well if i want to like this family thing that has always nurtured me and has always kept me going and that this old form of family like isn't gonna like be here for me isn't here for me anymore so my only option seems to be getting married so If I don't want to be lonely anymore, maybe this is the only way that I can actually have, even though it kind of goes against everything, it goes against what I actually want. Maybe if I don't want to be lonely, this is the only way. Um, And that's kind of how I interpret that rather than as wanting another kind of romantic love. But again, there are many ways to interpret a thing. All of them are good. Many of them are good. Yeah. Both of those are good. I think also that is something I love about asexuality in general is sometimes dragging apart these ideas of love romantic love platonic love and also sexual desire and pulling all these apart and being able to look at them sometimes even separately and in that scene you have so many different expressions from joe about these things because with the word lonely you can mean so many different things right because you can be in a marriage with 15 kids and still be lonely as hell that can still just leave you so alone and feeling so lonely and i think It's everything you just said about her coming home to this house that used to be such a foundational sense of joy for her because she was never lonely at home. She was always surrounded by the people who cared most about her, who she cared most about in the world. And her closest sister is gone and everyone else is just off and gone. And even writing doesn't give that sense of belonging to her anymore in that moment. And that, I think, what feels makes her feel so lonely. And that's why I don't interpret that as her desiring romantic love in that moment. Because that's sort of the last thing on the list. But that's the thing that she, because of imaginomativity, yeah. sort of grasps to. Maybe Laurie will, like, ask me again. <laughs> maybe this will fix everything. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> One of the things that I really loved online as well, which I really took from the 90s, and the 2019 film was that there's a lot of autistic readings of Joe as well, which I love. And it's this idea of a character who just questions sort of social norms around them all the time. And the scene where Meg, in, especially in the 90s one, when she's hurt her ankle because the shoes are too small and Lori offers up the carriage and she just goes, oh no. And then Joe just looks up at her sister going like, what? <laughs> you need a way to get home. She's just being very logical. He has a carriage. What's the big deal? And Meg cared so much more about the social norms of we have not been probably introduced to each other yet. We're not that close yet. I don't know if my mother would feel about us riding in the same carriage together. What would the neighbors think, etc., etc. And also her hyper-focus and special interest seems to be riding. And that's what seems to be giving her a lot of calm and really makes her happy. And also her hatred for anything changing ever. I just thought that was so beautifully depicted as well. If you read Joe as an autistic person and whenever someone is talking about getting married or when she realizes John Brooke is interested in her sister, she just always moves in between them like, no, like my sister is mine. This is the setup that I like. I like being in my house with my sisters. And she talks so often about why do I have to get married at all? And just questioning societal norms, like I said, and also her just pure anger when Amy burns her manuscript, this just also has such a great depiction of something that is so dear to you. It's the outburst of yeah. anger in that sense. As far as reading her as different things, but I love 
Joe March also being read as an artistic character, which I really enjoy. I think we're going to talk about how Amy could also be read as an artistic character a yeah. little bit later on when we talk about Amy as well. Yeah. But yeah, definitely. I, I think it's so interesting with Joe as well, like how she's this self-insert character without being a really flat character, because often a self-insert character, if we think about like Daphne from Bridgerton or something like that, she's just kind of nothing because she can be everything whereas with joe you can read so many things into her because there's so much going on because she's a really richly laid character rather than a she's a quite a shallow and not particularly well developed character that was the bit of the show that i found the least bit interesting sorry i, I did not expect to talk about prediction <laughs> well like <laughs> That's sorry, I... we don't have to actually talk about Richardson. <laughs> no, sorry, because in the second season, Anthony is so much more of a flawed character, so it makes... And everyone loved the fact that the first season was just banging all the time, and the second season was just, to me, much more interesting because it had an interesting <laughs> lead character. And that's not the actress. <laughs> Behind the scenes shots, every once in a while on Instagram, just making a post when someone was taking a picture. Every single still I've seen of this actress has more personality than that character did the entire season. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, That's okay. Back to Joe. Yeah. Um, I wanted to pick up on something you said earlier about loneliness and what loneliness looks like and how loneliness can look very different in very different situations mm -hmm. and for different people. Because I want to think about Joe and Aunt March as parallel figures, as potentially both asexual figures as well. So I think that... Cause when I was first thinking about Aunt March and Joe as parallel spinstery kind of figures, I was thinking about it in terms of progression and women and liberation of women. And Aunt March is this lonely figure. She's this kind of stereotypical spinster. She lives alone in a big house. She has a poodle. I mean, in the 2019 version, she has a poodle. I think in the 90s version, she had like a lot of different pets. She's less to do in the 90s version. She lives alone with animals. She's very grumpy and quite controlling. And just this figure who lives alone. And she's like wicked old Aunt March kind of want to resist villainizing that spinsterhood as something that's inherently bad compared to joe as more outgoing and more sociable character i want to resist the idea that it's bad to be happy on your own and happy seeing people at your own pace and not wanting to get married and like having a poodle i don't <laughs> think that's inherently bad <laughs> but you can still see how the movies perhaps i think the movie is still asked trying to encourage you to read joe as a progression into a different kind of spinsterhood but I still want to push back against the idea that that other kind of spinsterhood is inherently bad in any kind of way. And I think the 2019 version also wants you to push back against the usual interpretation of Anne March as the mean old woman, not just in showing yes. you, but also telling you. Definitely. Because when Meg gets married, there's a moment when Meg makes some comment about it's better than being alone in someone's house or something. And then Anne March goes, I heard that. And then she says to Marmy, I like being alone or something to that effect. And then yeah. I, and then Marmy says, we know this. I love the fact that the 2019 version was also pushing back against this idea that, yeah, yes, she isn't a very likable person. She isn't. She's very nagging. She's very controlling and still has all of those qualities. But that doesn't mean that she's yeah. a sad, lonely old lady in a house. She maybe no, just she likes still it has that family. Way. She could have a load of family around her if she wanted to, but she chooses not to. It does respect her in that way, and it can present her as dislikable whilst also presenting her as a character that you can respect as well. Which, yeah, no, I think you're right in terms of especially the 2019 version. I love the fact that because you brought this up for the first time, I'd never thought about Joe and Anne March in that way before. Is it they're both called Josephine? <laughs> like the yeah, they're both Josephine called Josephine. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty sure Alcott did, not to get put too much into into tensions, but I'm pretty sure she did write them both as parallel characters mm -hmm. and as characters that you're supposed to read as, yeah, as and compare the, the two of them. I think also Aunt March also reads as quite an ace character. Again, at the wedding, or, or, when she's talking to Joe and she's like, oh, I don't suppose you're that interested in marriage. I don't blame you. <laughs> one of the reasons that, she, that you're kind of, it. it's inferred that she doesn't want, yeah. You can infer that she doesn't want to get remarried, is that she wants to hold on to her She's like, I don't have to marry because I'm rich, um, and I made sure to hold on to my money. And the way she did that is to not marry again, because then obviously her property would become her husband's property. But then you also get that sense that another reason she doesn't want to remarry, again, is because she enjoys her own company and being alone. And I think at the wedding, doesn't somebody... Is it Meg tries to kiss Aunt March? She's like, oh, I don't, I don't like to be kissed, and that's just her yeah. in the boundary. And that actually doesn't come across as too villainized or anything or as weird. It's just Aunt March doesn't like to be kissed and that's fair enough. It's also Laurie who kisses um, her when they're in the carriage. And she's immediately like, get off of me. <laughs> yes. 
She has very specific yeah. boundaries, and people don't seem to have a whole lot of respect for them. Uh, yeah. I mean, you could read that as just like, oh, a centric old woman, but I think it does do quite a good job of being respectful of Aunt March. Like you were saying, I think you're right. I also like what you also pointed out to me, which is that Aunt March has an added understanding of Marmy that Joe just doesn't, and that's all how they mm-hmm. differ. I loved your reading on that. In the 2019 version, Gerwig gives and March a lot more a lot more of an understanding of her as someone who's been part of this family for a lot longer than Joe because she's so much older and she's seen the love story between Marmy and Mr. March, whatever his name is, I don't remember. <laughs> um but um we talked about that scene where Joe says Marmy loves her life and then she immediately and March immediately claps back and is like, You don't know what she loves. Yeah. And it's showing again, it's that question of capital and money and power and relationships and gender that sort of Aunt March has that perspective of knowing in a way that Joe doesn't even know of what the limitations of marriage can be or marriage and loss of money specifically marriage is an economic proposition Mm -hmm. uh, that Joe doesn't understand and the impact that has on their mother and we're going to talk more about Marmee in quite a lot more detail soon Um, but yeah I think this film the 2019 version gives a lot more space to Aunt March as a character and what someone with their own complex backstory and understanding of who they are. Also talking about I, Capital, one of the things that also never occurred to me until you and I started talking about these movies is that Aunt Marmy gives a family member quite a BS job just so they have some sort of income. And because the book is written yeah. more from Joe's perspective, she just talks about this horrible old woman in the family she doesn't like having to work for her for money. But... And March could also very well just pay someone else to read for her if this is really something that she cares about. My interpretation is that she does this. And maybe this is mentioned in the book and some book fan is going to listen to us talking about it. But it's in the book. I feel like Anne March only gives this job to Joe because she wants them to have some sort of income that's safe and that they cannot get fired from because, yeah. And that's interesting as well because she's so focused on the March sisters getting married so that they can be economically stable. Mm-hmm. An old fa- Obviously an old-fashioned kind of viewpoint, but also one that's still very relevant to them and to their situation. It's very pragmatic. And that's why she vibes so much with Amy is that they're both very pragmatic characters. And she's like, well, you're going to have to be the salvation of this family because none of your sisters are going to marry well. You need to marry well so that you can actually support your family. But I think it is interesting that, yeah, she gives Joe a job because she's got this awareness of finance and what finance means and the importance of women having money and having finances to their personal happiness and just to their livelihoods. Yeah. yeah. Which is really interesting. Kind of going back to Aunt March and Joe as parallel figures, though, and as parallel spinster figures, because I think that whilst Aunt March represents the figure of spinsterhood as old spinster alone in a house, Joe is this new woman figure which was that's new one with like capital letters. It's this figure that came in the nine towards the end of the nineteenth century. As the, I'll give you a quote actually. So this new woman figure encapsulated the shifting role of women at the fin de siècle, and the fin de siècle is just which is probably badly pronounced, but just the turn of the century between like nineteenth century, twentieth century, essentially. So on one level, she's marked as this figure of freedom, this free spirit. This is a quote from Buswell, which I'll link in the show notes. So this figure of freedom, a free-spirited and independent woman, educated and uninterested in marriage and children, simultaneously demonised as sexually decadent, a loveless spinster spitted against the other female type, which was the idyllic, conventionally submissive angel of the house. She's not like the other girls. (laughs) Because it's just creating a new archetype, and so moving from this submissive archetype to the outgoing archetype, which I think Jo very much falls into, even though she's a little bit early for the new woman archetype it was developing around that time it's like this wild girl was the kind of proto new woman figure which joey is described as wild and also i mean she's very intellectual she's uninterested in marriage she's all of these characteristics of the new woman especially in the 2019 version but also in the 90s version as well you've got joe as a character who's able to move around quite a lot she's got quite uninhibited freedom of movement which in the 2019 version it's sort of she wasn't made to wear hoop skirts like her sister's like Joe's sisters were. Lesha Ronan was given costumes, allowed her this freedom of movement. In one of the opening scenes, you see her running through New York and this joyous freedom of movement. She always have like, like the free-flowing hair. In every adaptation she has, tends to always have the least restrict, Not restrictive, because it's also quite practical, I imagine, but she always has the most loose, the least tied up hair. I don't know how to say that. Even if her hair is made to be more gathered, there's always hair falling, hanging off of her head. Just also represent that wilderness to a degree. Yeah, definitely. 
And I think it's also connected to a certain Americanness as well. I did just read this off the Wikipedia page for Little Women, but Joe March was sort of the original kind of like girl next door character, mm. very little American woman of America. It's so interesting because it's such a rom-com trope as well, but it's specifically American yeah. thing of falling in love with the boy next door is such a common thing that happens in American romantic stories. So that's so interesting. Yeah. And I think also Joe's freedom that she represents, this kind of female liberation that she represents, is partly to do with intellect, partly to do with finance, also to do with this concept of wilderness, which I think is also very American. Wilderness is this idea of this untamed, untouched land that the masculine individual goes out into, improves their manliness, proves their ability to be self-sufficient, and look after themselves in this open landscape and the freedom of this frontier, which is a very American colonial myth of the kind of empty land. Obviously, was not empty. Obviously, had been cultivated. It's a very white, masculine, individualist ideal that you see coming through in quite a lot of Joe's, in parts of Joe's characterization. Yeah, absolutely. And it's this racist, like you said, this racist connotation of this wilderness that then gets to be tamed by this white masculinity specifically, mm -hmm. because it's there for the taking, right? It's, yes. No one's ever been there before. Lord knows what we will discover there. It's that kind of attitude. And I think part of Joe's liberation, again, part of her as a figure of liberation comes from her connection to that, even though she's more focused on the writing, but she still can run around in the field. She goes out into the outside she goes out into the nature around her, is very independent, and it's that kind of thing, I think, built into her as a figure of female liberation. Yeah. And they built that also into, like you said, in this imagery of running around a lot, and in the very beginning of, after she is at the publishers in the 2019 one, you see her running through New York, you see her dancing at the stance hall. It's also with the camera work, it's very shaky. It's the most shaky that the camera gets in that entire movie. It's at the dance hall, you see her really exploring new spaces in like a metaphorical way. That's the most diverse space she's also been mm -hmm. in. A lot of people in that dance hall don't speak English. And you have that imagery of just her running around a lot in nature, being, again, never really having her hair tied up in proper manner ever. There's always strands hanging off her face. And I also think it's interesting because Catherine Hepburn was famously athletic, especially for a woman of her time. And in the 1933 mm. version as well, she runs around so much and jumps over fences and everything. Even the old depictions that are at this point, what, 90 years old? Even those depictions, they made sure to cast someone who was very athletic because they wanted someone to run around as Joe. They don't want her to be static. She's, like you said, she's sort of representing this progress in a way. Because this depiction of women characters and sisters made me, period dramas made me think of Jane Austen a lot as well. Elizabeth Bennet has often commented on how she, because you told me about this image of the bicycle, which I think is interesting. Because Elizabeth yes. Bennet to me is the opposite of that. And since, I mean, also bicycles were the thing, but this idea of waiting for a carriage is the opposite of Elizabeth Bennet. She always just walks everywhere. And it's this image of freedom of not wanting to be tied down by technology either in a weird way of being like well i can just yeah. also just go i can also just yeah. I, can, I can decide when to leave and i think that's also the freedom you get with bicycles yeah just to explain when bicycles came in they were seen as really revolutionary because yeah you can get somewhere quite far on under your own steam and that was seen as this quite liberating technology for a lot of people because it was also quite a lot cheaper than having a horse and carriage also meant that women could ride around like get places under their own steam if you live quite far off from a local village or town or whatever, you could get there now with this new technology. They were bicycles. You don't think, or I don't think about it quite so much. I didn't think about it in this way, but like they are quite a liberating technology, like pre public transport, pre cars, pre etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, or in areas where you don't have cars, you don't have great public transport. Bicycles yeah. are a great thing. In Little Women, it is still getting somewhere under your own steam, Mo being <laughs> able to have the yeah freedom of movement to just journey and get places yourself. So yeah, so that's Jo March as a new woman spinster figure, in comparison to Aunt March as like a spinster figure. And initially when I was thinking through this section, I was like, maybe Jo represents the growing freedom of women and a better form of spinsterhood. But I think, again, I want to push back against the idea that there's a better form of the unlonely spinster. However, I think she does represent a different form of spinsterhood, and I think that's sort of very represented within Jo and her relationship to the house, and Aunt March's relationship to... It's Plumfield, Plumfield Manor, yeah, um, which so, yeah. Aunt March leaves to Joe in her will. And I feel like this house represents 
a form of financial independence in a way. When Aunt March lives in this house, it's quite empty. There's no nuclear family in it. Initially, when I was thinking about this, I was like, oh, it's like the spinster curse. But I think also you could read it as a form of solitude, but a chosen solitude like we've talked about with her and her dogs. So this house isn't being used for what it was initially built with in mind as home to a nuclear family type thing. And then when Joe inherits it, again, she's like, oh, Meg, would you like this house? She's like, no, it's really impractical. Me and my nuclear family couldn't live here. It's too big. We don't have the money for that. And so instead of remaining empty or instead of going to the nuclear family, the house becomes a school. The house becomes this space of an alternative form of family and a collective of people who aren't necessarily related but are all connected to each other. And so it's not about marriage at the end. It's about this alternative form of community, alternative form of family, where you don't have to be married to not be lonely in the sense of being around other people and having this house bursting with people. And so it's a very different kind of spinsterhood on the one hand, where it's individual alone, and then you have spinsterhood where it's individual amongst many other people. And I think, again, you can read this as neither is necessarily better than the other, but both are kind of forms of existing as an individual person without loneliness, but one's individual alone versus individual as part of a collective, which I think is just really interesting as sort of parallel things. It also, like you said, feels like a comment on the capital understanding of this, because to end March, despite wanting to be alone, she could still use this house to house other people and extend yeah. this like immense fortune that she seems to have to other people. But she very much just doesn't do that. Joe's attitude is first to give it away to someone who she knows has kids. And then when that person is like, and this is also my mother's comment on every house that I ever saw in a movie like this. And also mine now. Where I'm like, who's going to clean this? All of these yeah. windows and all those old ass rugs. Who's going to get the dust out of those and those giant curtains and everything? Who's going to dust those? Having a giant house is also just a huge amount of work. Heating that kind of house also is super expensive and everything. Like you, like you said, it's not practical. The fact that Joe makes this a community based thing that she says let's take this thing in the capitalism of the time is meant to be for one rich person and let's extend this to the community and it feels very utopian in the 2019 version because even in the script it says yeah. uh, boys and girls of every of all races or something play yeah <laughs> it's like as much as i do love it as a sort of here's an alternative form of community that you can exist in that isn't the nuclear family isn't that cool it also does play into a stereotype or like the utopian multiculturalism we're gonna have like a school for boys and girls of all races everybody gets along in harmony and isn't that beautiful and without addressing okay no like structural racism and sexism <laughs> do still exist and would still exist within this structure even if you're trying to build something outside of the existing structures i think it is also interesting the fact that like alcott's own father tried to create this little commune thing oh, yeah, good point. <laughs> um, that was supposed to be like, separate from society and folded within like a few months because they literally ran out of things to eat because yep. they were like all starving which obviously isn't quite what they're doing here but it's that kind of oh we're an oasis outside of society is kind of what they're gesturing towards, which is a little bit like, mm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Her dad was a character. <laughs> oh god, I don't. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> that was interesting. Yeah, but I do still quite like, with all that criticism, I do still quite like the idea of subverting something's like original function and using your means to create something different out of society. So in real life, Mister Alcott, the father of Louisa Mal Alcott, he. Again, we're talking about what the adaptations take from real life as opposed to the book and put into the different movie adaptations. So in real life, Mr. Alcott started a school and let black children attend the school. And because of that, it was shut down because of segregation yeah. laws or even whatever yeah. that came I think before it just that. I think it's people pulled their children out of the school or something. I, don't, I think it was shut down. I think it just folded. It didn't last, basically, because of the racism at the time, either legal or just interpersonal racism. Yeah, and I think they included that. I don't think that was part of the book, but they included that in the 2019 version of the film as something that Aunt March references when she's talking to Joe. And it's sort of weird utopia that they've created out of this structure that hasn't fundamentally changed. So it doesn't make sense why they'd be able to create this utopian space. Like, even if they did have the money or more of the money to keep it running, this family isn't... I mean, I guess Laurie's there, so maybe they have some money as well, but it still doesn't ring quite true. 
especially as in the book, I think Joe just opens a school for boys. So yes, yes, they've really lent heavily into the kind of utopianism of it all, um, which isn't quite ring true for me. They also specifically mention it in the 90s version where when Mick goes to that cotillion or coming out party, I don't remember what it was called, but they say, someone talks like, didn't your dad's school have to shut down because they admitted a little black girl? They very specifically mention them. And that also in that scene didn't feel too preachy to me because it felt more that because they were talking about different things and they were talking about how the March family always seems to have like, oh, they are so political. That's that kind of bitching that was going on in the background of that scene. And so it didn't feel too preachy to me, but still put in the real life circumstances of education for little kids at the time. And I did think that was very interesting. Yeah of what to do with that kind of a space. And as critical as I am of this ending, I do think it's still quite beautiful. And what they're trying to represent, I think, as well, is that there is this almost return to childhood. There's this kind of sense of passing on this legacy. This is how we feel about how both and March and this kind of spinsterhood and Joe represents this different kind of spinsterhood without... Again, there's nuances to this. It's not negative or positive. It's just different versions of the spinsterhood type. And how this is also represented within the space of this house. What Plumfield represents in that context, in the story, and in the adaptation. And we're now going to move on to Beth. And Beth is someone we have a lot to say about because she is also, again, semi-autobiographically assumed to be based on an actual sister of Joe. I keep wanting to say Joe Marge. Uh, of Louisa May Alcott's Elizabeth Sewall? 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 I think Sewall, I think. Sewall, okay. And she's a sister that passed away, sadly. Actually, most of them died. Yeah, I mean, they all did eventually. I mean, but... yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, but a lot of them didn't get to be that old. Her mother got to be quite old, but the sisters all didn't live that long. Yeah. According to the life articles, this is the character, this is the sister this is based on. This is always the way that this is being framed, as Beth is always based on Elizabeth. Elizabeth died when she was 22 years old. I think we both think that Beth as a character is often quite underdeveloped in the different adaptations, and I think this possibly comes down to the way that Alcott represented her in the original text and the way that she adapted her. But I think it is very interesting to compare how Beth is represented in the text and then to how Elizabeth actually was as a person. The Life article talks about how there isn't an awful lot written about Elizabeth, how she was relatively, because she didn't live for that long, like relatively little compared to the other sisters is known about her. However, adaptations haven't really picked up on sort of Beth as a character and developed her much beyond, well, she's the sick one. That seems to be the thing that most people know her for. And to be honest, seems to be the way that most adaptations portray her as her main characteristic. I feel like there's a lot of ableism in the way that at the time when this 22-year-old was dying, was being treated, and at the same time how that's reproduced in this story, and then in every adaptation since then. Because all of the adaptations of Beth present her as this very pure, good... Yeah, she's too good for this world. She's very calm about her death. She's, you know, in the 2019 version, when Joe's sad, she's like, no, Joe, you need to accept this. I'm not afraid. I'm ready. I'm ready for this. Some things you just can't stop. Yeah. And she's all about calming the other, her siblings and her mother. It's all about, you know, she's got a lot of humility and she's a very calm one. Whereas in real life, according to the Life article, it says she lashed out at her family and her fate with an anger that she had never before expressed. Yeah. And how they also treated this 22-year-old person dying as a child when this wasn't what she was because she was 22 years old. And it says that her disease had made her look like a middle-aged woman. It was quite straining for her um, to be the sick for so long. And yeah. again, you're talking about a disabled person here. I mean, this is a 2019 version of the film, but something that's happened quite a lot with long COVID and stuff like that. This idea of getting some sort of virus or some sort of sickness that makes you weaker and makes you less capable of getting out of bed or just not having the energy to participate in a lot of things in the way that society is organized. But just in general, those kind of things have always existed. Those kind of diseases yes. and people who are disabled. And the fact that that never gets shown in the respectful manner really annoys me at this point to be honest because she doesn't really do a lot and she talks about be good be like 
do what Marmy taught us, do it for others. When someone criticizes themselves, even when Amy says, I don't like my nose or something, like you immediately, Beth is there to be like, I like your nose. Beth is just, her shyness is always shown as, again, something you could really exploit with a lot of depth because a lot of shy people have a lot of inner monologues going on, but you hardly ever get to see that because Beth almost seems to more exist as a character to like motivate Joe. And it's more about how her death traumatizes Sho and her mother rather than what the disease and being sick does to Beth in her personality. Exactly. Beth isn't really allowed to be an individual. Yes. In a way, it's the irony that this story is lauded as having these very complex female characters and allowing these women to have this space to be realized. But Beth always seems to kind of end up filling in that almost manic pixie dream girl muse role like mm -hmm. her death and her storyline is all about how it moves the other characters specifically joe she doesn't really get to have her individual storyline she's all about supporting the other characters which i think is just the kind of ableism maybe inherent within this story or the way that elcott wrote it especially when compared to real life elizabeth sewell and how she felt about her death mm -hmm. and about her illness it took her of a lot of her autonomy and agency to make her this supporting character I think um, every adaptation doesn't really understand that this is a disabled character. Yeah. To them, this yeah. is just, it's just tragedy. Isn't this so sad? And you're like, yeah, for yeah. you. But what about her? Yeah, exactly. It falls into, and I think this is something where the 2019 version especially falls down when it's challenging that marriage or death trope by just making her death just like, precisely into that tragic death stereotype, exactly into that trope. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think... This is something that we were thinking about in terms of Beth. She, in a way, is very similar to Jo in many respects. She also doesn't want to get married, questions this idea of forming a nuclear family, questions a lot of roles of the status quo. But she never really picked up as this, in the discourse around this, or not that I've seen anyway, mm -hmm. is, or is particularly picked up or talked about as a queer character or as an autistic character or as anything, always gets sidelined, that people don't, um, really dig into her and I think that's partly a problem with this, these adaptations don't treat her character as something that should be explored and given the depth that Jo is given. Yeah, because what are her dreams? What is something that she desired to do? In I don't know how much of that is based in the book because I don't remember everything in the book. She at one point says I don't know if this is the 90s version or the 2019 version, but she never really made plans for herself. She almost yeah. asked for this destiny or some shit. This is such nonsense because see, this is the thing. If this is Alcott writing about her experiences with her sisters and using this as some closure to understand her grief around her sister. But then again, every adaptation we talked about takes stuff from real life and improve upon it, enrich the story because they said, well, this part doesn't feel too, doesn't feel rounded enough, doesn't feel complex enough of a character I'm not satisfied with this. So I'm going to take stuff from real life and insert it here to make this more of a character. And I think Beth is a character where they rarely ever do that. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it could have been so interesting if they'd explored her as a potentially a queer character, yeah. or as this queer solidarity with Joe. But I think it's that whole. I think it's that ableism of presenting Beth as just passive and a victim, mm -hmm. and the fact that she is sick is that's all that she is. There's no exploring that as a whole part of her personality. I know. I guess it's infantilization again of disabled characters, and she can't have a sexuality, and she can't have the agency to have a sexuality or asexuality even. Because it would give her even too much agency, even in that, right? Yeah, that that be too much agency, and having a depth of character, and also seeing her as more than just a child as well. Again, Elizabeth Sewell died at the age of twenty-two. She was. Um, I'll read the quote actually from the article. Uh, John Ma Matteson who wrote about Louise May Alcott and her family, said that, so Emerson told the officiating minister, who did not th know the family well, that Lizzie was a good, unselfish, patient child who made friends even in death. Everyone seemed to forget that they were not burying a child, but a woman of 22. Again, this infantilization of Beth. She's not allowed to be seen as a developed character, developed human being with her own desires and wants and her own ambitions and her own internal life. Even within this adaptation, she's seen as a child. Even in the parts where everyone else has grown up, she stays this childish figure. Which, yeah, I think speaks to like ableism within, not just within the original text, because again, you can, like we've talked about with the ending of the text, you can change it, you can adapt it to reflect present day feminist values. 
I think it is an issue with adaptations and with how people interpret this text as well that's at fault here. Yeah. And it's not just based in feminism, it's also just disability. In real life disabled people get infantilized all the time and people get so shocked whenever disabled people have sexual desires or sex or families or kids. There's always an assumption of selfishness that's always yeah. thrown at them for that. By representing Beth as this character, I could doesn't ever seem to exist for herself. Mm-hmm. Again, gives sort of this wholesomeness to her just not belonging on earth for being too pure. And it's so fucking condescending. I hate it so much. Yeah. Even the scene in the 90s version where she dies, Joe turns to open the window and when she turns back, Beth, it's almost Beth's soul has left the body and joined God or something. Even when they're at the beach in the 2019 version, because I think that's where Beth says you cannot stop God's will. And then Joe goes, well, watch me try or something like that. You know, even that is more about Joe being unreasonable than it is about Beth and her. And again, I don't know how she feels about any of this because no one ever bothers to give me her perspective on anything. And also, we talked about this with the 90s version because they recast Kirsten Dunst's first, the kid Amy, and then you have another actress playing the adult Amy. Everybody gets to age and grow in a certain sense. Lori gets a goatee. Claire Dinch just becomes paler and paler and paler. (laughs) She just becomes more and more like a ghost or something. You sort of, again, don't give that person a story arc, a character development of sorts. Yeah. Something. Other than dies. Yeah. Even her like characterization that she does get with like playing the piano and being beloved by Mr. Lawrence and being good to the Hummels, her characterization is just good. She doesn't really get to have flaws, mm-hmm. other than perhaps she's too childish maybe, because yeah. you know, she's still playing with dolls as an adult. Other than that, but she kinda keeps this childhood innocence. When she dies, it's the like childhood innocence has died and that's what like gives Joe that breakdown because like that last thing from her childhood is gone. That's not enough that's not the same complexity that's given to the other March sisters. And that's still about how she furthers other people's plot lines. I'd like to see an adaptation do Beth well. I'd really love to see an adaptation where Beth is yes. given that space and complexity and an adaptation that respects her in that way. Yes, I, I completely agree. And that's something that they could very much build upon because I was going to say they couldn't do much worse. I mean, they absolutely could. That is generally something where you have nothing but space to grow. Mm. We are both hoping for more respect for Beth as a character and as a person. Yeah. So for the next generation of, um, <laughs> for, yeah, the next generations of women, yeah, can we have more respect for Beth, please? Yeah. And 2019 was three years ago, so get cracking. <laughs> next one. <laughs> yeah. Next one, please. Um, okay, and with that, I think we can move on to the oldest March sister. Yes. We are, of course, talking about the character Meg, who was based on, according to the Life magazine article, or Life Issue, was based on Alcott's sister Anna, mm-hmm. the eldest of the March sisters. Yeah, I feel like she's quite a hit or miss character. Yeah, I agree. I much prefer it in the 90s version to, even though I don't prefer the 90s version overall, I do think she's much even in some ways she's given she's given less screen time, but they use that a lot more and they yeah. give her a lot more depth than in the 2019 version. I very much agree. She's seen as this gold elder sister who wants to be the model sibling. In the 2019 one, there's one moment where she says, we're meant to be good or we're meant to be great for something. And then Joe immediately throws a pillow or something at her and it's like, don't be mom just because mom's not here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think Meg is supposed to be what she's supposed to represent is the, or what I gather from the 90s version, which I think does this better. I think she's supposed to represent this caring and responsible figure. And then her flaws are that she's struggling to keep up this image because she's still a young woman and she's having to deal with this responsibility that she's not really ready for. And she she still wants these nice things. She still wants to party and do frivolous things. She doesn't want all this responsibility, which I think the 90s version works in showing that because it kind of sets her up as this responsible character. Whereas I feel like the 2019 version, one of the reasons it kind of falls flat is because it doesn't properly set up that this is what we're supposed to see this figure as. The first thing that you see her doing is buying the fabric they can't afford, which maybe that works if you have an understanding of Little Women, a kind of more a lot wider consciousness of it. You've grown up reading the books, seen the 90s version. You know that Meg is supposed to represent this responsibility. That makes sense. This is her flaw. But if, like me, the first time you're actually interacting with this text is the 2019 version, it doesn't really work 
because you kind of need it to set up that oh she's the responsible one before she breaks that responsibility if that makes sense I mean even having seen the 90s one to be honest I just felt like it was such a downer whereas I don't remember <laughs> from the 90s version I just don't remember Meg as being a downer story because it's meant to be she meets someone she kind of finds them intriguing she before I watched the 2019 version I'd seen the series and the 90s version and mm -hmm. it's the story about the triumph over poverty in a weird way she fell for someone that no one really wanted her to marry her mother wasn't against it was being more pragmatic about it and march was very very vocally against it and that happens in almost every adaptation now then the 2019 one there's an interaction with yeah. Anne march who sort of steps in and goes no that's the moment when Meg usually goes, actually, I do love him and I do want to marry him. And then the 2019 one, you just don't get that because it starts, like you said, with, I cannot afford this. And then she goes, $50, what was I thinking? And every time I watch this adaptation, I'm like, $50 in 1860s? What the? <laughs> like, how much well, money was that? Yeah. Like, $50 is a lot of money now to spend on something. How much were $50 back then? Yeah, Holy God. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you said that it's a little bit different in the book. Yeah, it's really funny, actually. In the book, I was doing a little bit of background research. I, I just went down an Aunt March rabbit hole and was just command effing to just see all the Aunt March parts. But there's, in the bit where Aunt March confronts Meg, it's presented more as Meg hadn't really made up her mind about John. She wasn't really sure if she loved him or not. And when Aunt March is like, don't marry him, it'll financially, it'll ruin you. She just goes off on one about how much she does love him, just kind of out of spite. Like there's a kind of <laughs> immature spitefulness where she's just like, actually, uh, no, I do really love him. And I do want to like marry him. And actually, he's the love of my life. And you don't know me. You can't control me. I'm going to do what I want. And then eternally, she's kind of like, oh, shit, he might have heard that. I'm not actually sure if this is what I want or not. But I guess I've kind of committed to this now. That's the best reason to marry someone out of spite. <laughs> to a family member just to be just like stubborn I'll show just you <laughs> yeah and she's like I hadn't really made up my mind but I guess now I kind of have oh well um which I just think is very funny that this kind of character flaws I think is again one of those things that people love about little women and how flawed and complex yeah. the characters are which just Meg in in the 2019 version anyway it's <sighs> she doesn't have access to the money that her friends have access to when it comes to public, uh, what's it called, it's events, she's always very aware of the fact that she's always wearing the poorest clothing. When she does have access to fancy dresses because of her friends, it makes her feel like, oh, this is what this is supposed to feel like. I really enjoy this, actually. But she also feels guilty about feeling that way. And I think that's why she's such a good layered character. I think most of this is due to the fact that you see it not in chronological order. She's just constantly like having issues and issues and issues. I didn't like when she goes, just because my dreams are different from yours doesn't mean they're not as important. It felt a little bit preachy. I see. Yeah, I, I do get that. I, I think I like that and I prefer that to some of the lines in the 90s one, which I felt like <laughs> were more on the nose. I, I quite like this as a conversation. Like, it's not my favourite line. I like the conversation, but that line in and of itself, I'm a little bit... Yeah. I feel like you got very good scenes with Amy, you got very good scenes with Joe. Mm -hmm. I feel like Meg, that was her sort of, here's me asserting who I am as one of the little women. Less convincing and less interesting than those two. But I didn't hate it. Yeah. I was just going to say that I think you're right about her and John. Their relationship isn't set up too well in the 2019 version i want to say yeah the scene where he's like i'm so sorry that i couldn't provide you with the things that you want and then he locks out <sighs> you know what i mean that's the line for a 14 year old who feels sorry for himself fine he's not he's not a teenager this is a grown-ass man with two kids i don't care yeah. for that crap yeah yeah it's funny because i feel like their relationship gets more screen time in the 2019 version like you get more scenes of them sort of interacting together in private yeah for sure than in the 90s version but in the 90s version there's so much more depth again it's show don't tell and it's and what you make of those moments seems like so much more just fulfilling and just there's something going on here i think the really key scene mm -hmm. in the 90s version is when Joe walks in on Beth and John, not Beth and John, sorry, Meg and John, like kissing <laughs> it like yeah. at Christmas. And she's like, whoa, what's this? But it's such a good moment of, it shows this depth of off-screen relationship that you haven't seen before. It hints that something much deeper is happening here, but because it's mainly from Joe's perspective, we don't get to see that much of it. But it still feels like you, you get that idea, that sense of the depth of their relationship. 
and also the layers to the characters as well you kind of get the sense that actually they're very passionate about each yes, other yes yes and yes, yes, seeing yes. It from a, and because we're seeing it from a younger perspective this doesn't quite make sense to Joe. she doesn't quite understand and also she's like not interested in that anyway and there's, there's layers to that as well yeah in every single adaptation you just always get this idea of this is the boring character john brooke is boring and doesn't sort of have depth or passion for anything from joe's perspective she feels it's more like puppy love type thing yeah it's the thing you said about using the time wisely you have one scene we don't know what happened between that and when they met for the theater clearly all this stuff has been going on there but just assumes that you're able enough as an audience to insert whatever you want into like those spaces in between and it still gives you like think a really good scene of giving you depth to two characters that you haven't seen that way before and it sort of shows you Joe is not a simple character. She's quite yeah. judgmental of a lot of people. And and I think that sense of her having to realize that she doesn't know what's going on with other people all the time yeah. is also something you get in that scene. It's just that realization of unreliable narrator is so, yes. cl- it's yes. so clear in that moment. You're like, ah. Yes. Oh. And it's. I love that scene. Yeah. And it's. And because she's so focused on her family and not wanting them to split apart as well. Like, it's one of the reasons why she's quite resistant to John is she doesn't want, like, going off with him. But it's. Yeah, I think that scene does more to be this is Meg's choice and this is what Meg wants. And it, again, it's show don't tell. Compared to the 2019 version, in a way I do agree with you, compared to her saying my dreams are different to yours, I think is the parallel scene to Meg kissing John under the mistletoe or wherever they're kissing. And I think it's so much stronger because it doesn't have to tell you this is what Meg wants because it shows you what Meg wants and it shows both of them wanting the same. I'm yeah. just realising too it's quite wrong, Kami, in a sense, because they're outside in the in the winter during Christmas in Massachusetts. It's probably cold as hell. And they'll, yeah. they don't care because they're making out. <laughs> they That's so care. cute. Another scene which I did not think about too much before we watched it this morning was one of the things too is you get less... I feel like in the 2019 one, John Brooke just as a character doesn't get as much personality. Mm-hmm. Like the one scene that I did like a lot is when all the girls are coming in and whenever Meg says anything, he just tries to be agreeable. Just just, just agree yes. with everything she's saying, which is so relatable. It's so funny. It's so f- <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> because of that, he keeps having to contradict his own point that he made like five seconds ago. But in the 90s version, one of the scenes that I also, I don't think I've shown enough love to before, is Lori uh, lifts the window and then screams at them like, hey, Joe, come over here, come over here. And then John Brooks says to him, hey, we don't shout at young ladies. And then in order to apologize to them, he also puts his head out of the window and then screams to them. <laughs> but yeah. the one scene that they tried to add to this, I think, in the 2019 version was when John Brooke says he's going to escort Marmy and she kisses him on the cheek. But that just, again, didn't do as much for me. As, yeah, yeah. No, I completely agree. Yeah. I wonder if it's partly casting choice as well. I'm not quite sure if Emma Watson quite lived up. Just, I always kind of got the impression that Joe was the eldest. From like watching it the first time, I didn't really think about Meg as the older sibling. I thought that was really interesting when you first told me that. I never know whether to blame the script or the pacing or the directing or the actor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's always going to be a mix, at least. Yeah. Yeah. I don't dislike Emma Watson. When I watched the Out of the Sisters, I found her to be the least compelling. Yeah. 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 I'll tell you one detail I did like. Sorry, I'm being quite mean to the 2019 version, but I mean, this might be a detail in the book as well. I'm not sure. Meg calls her daughter Daisy, which is also the name that she's given as like a pet name when she's at the party, (gasps) which I only realized this viewing because I had the subtitles on and she was like, Daisy. Oh, that's so cute. I didn't notice that. Yeah. And I was like, I wonder what that says about Meg. It kind of gives her rich nickname to her child. Aspirational. It's kind of almost quite sad. You're sort of, yeah, maybe aspirational. Maybe I couldn't have this for myself, but I want this for my children. Or this is a life that I could have had, but I didn't have but I'm going to give it to my... Like, she hasn't quite let go of that dream, which kind of does speak to her character as, you know, like wanting to spend that money on the dress and things. The worst version of Meg still has to be in the book, how bad her faith is. Uh, fate, sorry, is because John becomes a huge a-hole about them having mm-hmm. kids, not being the center of attention. And I think in the book, Marmy sits both of them down and says to Meg she needs to devote herself more to being a wife and to John that he needs to be more attentive or something. Those are not the same thing. This woman has just given birth to twins. (laughs) Yeah. Can you be a little bit less selfish here? But yeah, that would be our take on Meg. It's a very hit or miss. 
Alright, should we move on to Amy now? One of the characters that is praised the most, rightfully so, for the 2019 version is the Dane social climber <laughs> that is Amy March. Yeah, her real life counterpart was Alcott's sister Abigail. Abigail, they were also um, not the richest family and Abigail apparently wrote a studying art abroad and how to do it cheaply guide, like a travel guide. And me and Anna, would, when we kind of heard about this, we were both just like, oh, oh, she'd be like a vlogger. She'd be like a lifestyle yeah. vlogger. Amy in Paris. An influencer. Yeah, yeah, she's such an influencer. The discourse around Amy is that often she's presented as the sort of villainous character or the character who's, in contrast to Jo, she's very interested in marriage, very interested in her looks, her quote-unquote vanity, and that gives her, I think maybe partly because just everybody loves Jo so much, she's often the least liked of the March sisters. But Gerwig's version does a very different thing with that. I think it's also because you don't really have a villain, because again, no one cheats on their wife, no one cheats on their husband. Mm. And also, yeah. especially if you want Jo to end up with Lori, of course you're gonna hit Amy then, if she's the one that ends up with a boy that was meant to end up with either Jo or you as the reader. Yeah, definitely. And also, again, even though there's no actual villain, it's like villa the villain is kind of circumstance, events that happen to the sisters, and like, Amy also takes Jo's place to go travelling in Europe without Mark. It's sort of the resentment that Jo has for Amy again, if you either self and insert yourself into Joe or just have a lot of sympathy with Joe. Again, there's another reason why you might see Amy as the bad guy. If Joe's not like the other girls, which I don't think she exactly is, but she also kind of like has elements of that, then Amy is like the other girls and is, um, you know, interested in marriage, interested in her looks. She's quite an assertive character. And I think that's something that Gerwig kind of brings out the assertiveness more than she could be interpreted as quite a bratty character because she's, I know what I want and I will like say what I want. We don't really allow, especially female characters, to have ambition. Yeah. If they don't sort of fit into very sort of stereotypical heteronormative. You know what I mean? Like no one hates Mick for yeah this idea of maybe wanting a husband and wanting to get married and have kids amy also just calling out the bullshit of the societal norms at the time is just gerwig really did this brilliantly i love this adaptation so much in that sense because it just yeah again it's that thing of society functions in a certain way and you're just supposed to go along with it you're not supposed to question it but he also knows to point it out people don't like yeah. that yeah. And I think that that's also very relatable. Yeah, and Amy's, you know, she says to Laurie, I always knew I would marry Rich. Why should I be ashamed of that? And that's kind of an unacceptable thing to do. Like you were saying, you're not supposed to point out these rules that exist. You're supposed to just follow them. But she's like, oh no, I'll follow them because I know they exist because I'm smart and I understand my place in the world. Like Jo, she's very intelligent and very intelligently knows where she is and where she stands. But unlike Jo, she decides to play that system and that she wants to be a part of that system. And she's very, very pragmatic. You're supposed to marry rich. Yeah. You're supposed to marry above your station. That's the whole point. But you're not supposed to do it intentionally. Yeah, she's got as much awareness and critique of the society as Joe does. Like, they both understand their social position. It's just, whereas Joe decides that she's going to rebel against that, Amy's like, well, I'm going to, like, work it to my advantage. They're both very similar in some respects, but kind of take very different approaches to, like, their understanding of the world. Gorbik gives Amy much more of a character arc in terms of, like, the 90s version almost is, like, one of the worst ones I've ever seen. Amy just becomes nothing. Yeah. She really has, like, a personality as a child, you know, when Kristen Dunst goes like, you'll regret this show, March. She's so bratty. I think it's really lovely to see and it's really entertaining to watch. Whereas when she's older, she just, yeah. like, her coming more mature is getting rid of her brattiness, but then yeah. giving her nothing else, she sort of just becomes almost like a fly on the wall that doesn't seem to have her own take on society yes. even when she's arguing with Laurie yes and I think that's what the 2019 version does so well and it kind of references that almost is that her brattiness as a child matures into assertiveness and a sort of like sense of knowing her own mind and asserting her values which then when you look back at her childhood self you can be like that was sort of her in development phase of her becoming this mature and assertive yeah. adult and she kind of references that at the end of the film when Joe's like oh you become so wise and she was like oh I've always been wise you're just too busy noticing <laughs> my flaws and then Meg's like oh they were never there in the first place <laughs> she was like an unpolished version of herself when she was a child who then matures into something like her full potential by the time she's an adult whereas in the 90s version she just kind of matures into she goes from like tea child maturing into just angel of the house kind of not very much going on kind of boring kind of daphne kind of nothing <laughs> i love the fact that we're yeah. just using daphne now from the reference oh, yeah. yeah sorry daphne uh <laughs> no but um i think i love this because that self-awareness and that just being sure in yourself yeah self-assurance self-assurance is already there as a child she always knew what she wanted it, the vanity goes away to a certain degree but like you said i love the fact that that again is planted in childhood and doesn't just sort of come out of nothing because the 90s version does uh your favorite hate 
hateful thing, which is the voiceover. When they go to the older version, they say like, they show a shot of her when they dance around the thing at the wedding. And they say like, Mm -hmm. as Amy said to us when she was a little girl, and then they'll give you a shot of the actress. Because those two characters in the 90s version feel not connected whatsoever. They're both blonde and they're both in the house. That's all they are in terms of being connected to each other. And... Because there's that scene where they're in Paris at this point, and she says, Rome has taken all the vanity out of me in Paris, made me realize I'd never be a genius. It is sort of in a weird way a tell-done show in that moment. You know why she's sort of become less famous, because she's traveled, and she's met many other people who are also very talented. And she realized, like, I'm not necessarily the best of the best yeah. when it comes to this. And that's again, has helped her, allowed her to grow her personality, and I think... That is amazing. I just love Amy so much in the 2019 version. Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. I know. Me too. And I feel like, again, this isn't necessarily something bad the 90s version does, but when Amy's a child, she's kind of more of a passive and innocent. Like, they kind of play up the sort of, like, innocence of childhood a bit more in the way they mm-hmm. present her. Because she's never shown as being actively, like, naughty. Like, you never see her. Like, when she burns Joe's manuscript, I think this is, like, the key bit. In the 90s version, you don't see her burn the manuscript. You just see Joe come home, manuscript isn't there, manuscript's in the fireplace. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the 2019 version, Gerwig shows you Amy very deliberately and very kind of stony-faced burning this manuscript, burning every single page, looking at it, the fire reflecting in her eyes. This is a very deliberate act that she's done, and that almost makes her... I mean, it's a choice to make her more of an active character, I think, by being like, she personally chose to do this thing yeah. it's not a very nice thing but she chose to do it and it's represented to us on screen and i think again that ties into amy as an active character she's active as a child and then she grows into an active adult as well i don't think she says this in a 90s version i think she only says this in a 2019 version but almost autistic logic that comes into this which is like yeah well i would have destroyed one of your dresses but that wouldn't have hurt you and i really wanted to hurt you you know what I mean? It's that thing of, well, I wanted to hurt you. Yeah. And I couldn't have destroyed something else. I needed to destroy something like your manuscript. Yeah. And not that she's not sorry. That's not the point. The point is this idea of destroying something that would have been e- more easily replaceable is not helpful because she wanted to cause pain. So <laughs> the manuscript was sort of the best option for that. And I just love that kind of, again, yeah. it's horrible. <laughs> But I love that logic of, well, restoring something else wouldn't have cost what I wanted to achieve. So yeah. the book it was. Yeah. But I love that shot of just her holding up the pages. It's so villainous. It's so almost Disney villain. Like I know. Yeah. It's so it's gloriously like, oh, I mean, it's great. It's so good. It's so good. But then she's not a monster for doing that. Like even, okay. In the life article, Gerwig describes Amy as a monster, which I think is an interesting choice because I feel like she's given Mm -hmm. so much complexity and nuance and depth. And maybe that's what Gerwig's referring to is women being allowed to be sort of vaguely monstrous rather than just like paradigms of goodness or, you know, childhood innocence. Like Amy as a child isn't just childhood innocence. She does mean things to Joe, but that doesn't make her like a terrible person. But I think that's kind of where this idea of Amy as a monster doesn't really work because a monster implies a value judgment and a flattening, perhaps. I mean, not necessarily, but like potentially a flattening to just a villainous character which she does the opposite with amy so i'm I'm not quite sure where that characterization comes from i'm not quite sure i agree perhaps monstrous but not monster i don't know but you also talked about this idea of children as just being that when they're still like learning the parameters of what is acceptable in terms of how you act and stuff and she is the smallest yeah. of four kids and there's this idea when she goes to school with the limes and stuff Meg gives her money even though Meg doesn't have enough money to give to her she's the one that has the least amount of responsibility to in the household because she's the youngest she just hasn't had to mature as much as the other ones have had to yeah she's been sheltered to a degree that the other ones have yeah. in these really difficult circumstances yeah yeah So we talked about how Amy often gets cast as the villain. And one of the reasons, as we said, is because Amy ends up with Mm Laurie, who we want to end up with Joe. And we also really loved what the 2019 version did with the romance between Amy and Laurie, because it always feels clunky in most other adaptations Mm -hmm. I've seen, even the series. Even though I would recommend the series, I didn't like that one either in terms of those two characters. And again, in the book, it's really creepy. 
I've told you this before, but it always feels like, I think in the 90s version, actually, they use that line when he says, I will be part of this family. (laughs) Gross. But it's interesting that they show more growth between those two characters and how they actually complement each other. Yeah. Yeah. In the 90s version, we talked about how it starts, the first thing you see between the two of them, which makes it weirder in the retrospect but the first thing you see is when Lori takes Amy away because Beth is sick with scarlet fever and so Amy has to leave the house in order not to get sick and die as well and then Lori talks to her about like she talks about she's never even had a kiss she's like I want to be kissed yeah I'm not I'm gonna die I might die and I've never even been kissed and then Lori says like oh I promise to kiss you before you die which isn't again you said this isn't necessarily kind of creepy in and of itself that could just be an adult sort of saying to a child like you know, I will, like that. There are different kinds of kisses. Like that's not like necessarily bad, but yeah. I think it could the, be like a forehead kiss. I mean, what the hell does a child know about like what a kiss is? Yeah, you know and it's, like, in that moment, it's kind of quite a tender sort of. It feels like a sibling moment, but then it's cute. Yeah, it's cute, but then it becomes kind of more weird because they those yeah. two characters end up getting together later on, and I think it's emphasized by the fact that in that scene, Amy is a child. The actress playing Amy is a child, whereas Laurie is Christine Bale. And when they grow up, Amy's then an adult actress and Laurie is still Christian Bale. It sort of like emphasizes the sort of like age and sort of like power. Goatee Christian Bale. Yeah, goatee Christian Bale's a completely different person, very <laughs> old, much older and very different looking. But it kind of emphasizes that weird power dynamic. It makes it feel a bit more strange. It's so um, creepy after the fact. When I, I remember like every time I watched that scene where she goes, I've never, I do think it's really cute when he says, I'll kiss you before you die. Because again, that idea of like, I've never been kissed it comes from completely comes from fairy tales and books. Yeah. And she doesn't know what that means specifically, but she has this romantic idea of what that means. And I think that's really cute because I imagine her parents also didn't spend a lot of time making out in front of her. Do you know what I mean? So to her kisses, you know what I mean? Like it's much more of an idea than a real thing. And I like the idea of him just kissing her on the forehead and being like, there. Yes. Yeah, like a- but because later on he then does end up marrying her, it makes it so freaking creepy. Yeah. And I think it's also the way he treats her when he's old as well it feels more just yeah like, again like you said it's like i will be part of this family and it's sort of like <laughs> their relationship doesn't really feel like it has time to develop whereas in the 2019 version i think it works because a there's not that kind of weird focus on laurie just wanting to be part of the family it kind of feels more organic they don't focus on that part of it and b she's given the space to reject him as well and it's only after she said like i will not be a second best to joe i've been second to joe in everything all of my life um and i won't be the person you settle for just because you cannot have her yeah the dialogue the dialogue is so good it's so good and you get to see that progression of their relationship and it feels organic and it feels earned by the end and it's sort of you see amy reject laurie and you also see them talk to each other as equals like, he asks for her advice. He's like, what do you think I should do? And she tells him, well, you should get a job. Like, don't write an opera about yourself. That's that's a waste of time. <laughs> like, make something of your life. You know, she offers him advice and he respects it and listens. Their relationship is a lot more him listening to her talk about stuff, even though he offers his opinions as well. She talks right back to them. And I think that's like a thing as well that's interesting with Laurie in this version throughout. And I think all the versions to an extent. But he is quite possessive of the March sisters. When he sees Meg at the party and he's like, oh, I don't like the way you dress. You shouldn't be dressing in this. And he kind of slut shames her in a way. And then just kind of the same thing with Amy when she's at that party. But then Amy's the one to talk back to him and say, no, listen, here is like... Yeah. I mean, he also listens to Meg to an extent, but Amy's like, no, listen, here's what it's like to be a woman. This is why I'm kind of treating marriage as an economic proposition, because it is for me, because I don't have my own property and because there are very few ways for me to make my way in the world. And he listens to her and actually respects that. And so it's like they are talking to each other as human beings and as equals rather than the kind of weighted power dynamic is even though it still obviously exists he makes space to listen to her opinion and it feels earned and it feels like yeah actually i quite like these two characters together because of that it's also the first time when he realizes that he is falling for her when she has given him the speech about marriage and fred Wong then comes to pick her up and again you could have made that more about him being jealous of Fred Wan, but that's not the point. The point is that that's the first time he's ever looked at her like an equal, and that's why he's able to fall for her, and that's what makes this so beautiful, and it doesn't feel... It always feels shoehorned in, sort of shoved in there without um, sort of giving them the proper time Breathing to develop. Yeah. yeah, the time, yeah. And like, yeah. 
And the thing, again, we talked about how Meg and John's relationship maybe also just doesn't feel as organic because you have the time jumps. Gorbik gave a lot more space and time to Amy and Laurie. But even though you have the time jumps, it still feels so beautifully told from beginning to end. Yes. Because you do start off with, chronologically speaking, even the 2019 version, you do start off with um, the first time you see them is when they see each other in Paris. Yeah. And they're so excited to see each other and she hugs them and stuff. But the first time they ever meet is when he comes to their house and you do have this child looking up at him being like, Oh my god, yeah. he's so pretty, or something. I'm assuming this. Um, she's like, just sort I'm of Amy. Very... He's like, hello. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And she's just has a very child crush on this, you know, boy who's older than her. But I think it's really impressive that despite the fact you have the time jumps, you still have such a satisfying look at that relationship. It's yeah. so well done, and that's the reason I rewatched the scene where they talk in the atelier. Um, in the workshop. I don't know what that's called in English. Where she paints. I've rewatched that scene so many times. Yeah. But we're going to talk about Lori a little bit more later as well. So, Marmy. Yes. Real name. Abigail. Abigail. <laughs> Which is, I think, pretty much only mentioned in the 90s version because Aunt March comes over to their house and calls her yeah. Abigail. Yeah, uh, I do think the 90s version does a slightly better job of portraying Marmy than the 2019 mm-hmm. version does because I mean the first time you're properly introduced or like when Laurie's introduced to the family and she he's like I know like thank you Miss March or whatever and she's like oh call me Marmy every or mother everyone does and it's immediately pres- like setting her up as just like this is the mother figure and her identity is mother I mean it's also in adopting Laurie into the family which is quite nice however yeah she's sort of like this traditional matriarchal figure and this sort of wholesome mother figure yeah yeah Christian like she's like girls yeah, girls, can you give up your Christmas breakfast for the Hummels? She cares about the war effort. She's shown to give away her scarf or something to this old man because she's pretty sure that he's homeless or just does not have enough to keep himself warm. Yeah, she's very self-sacrificing. Yeah. She's also self-aware of how bad her country is. She's like one of the good ones because she's aware that her country is bad. She's like, I'm ashamed of my country. And sort of like, she's one of the good white people. She's aware and self-aware. And it's righteous in her sort of self-awareness. It does feel like a very post, I didn't even know what to call it, post-2016 mm-hmm. kind of mentality, though. As a mainstream film, I would say, to have a character like that say, I'm ashamed of my country. If this was an early 2000s film, post-9-11, yeah. it would yeah. be a lot more of, this country can still do great things. You know what I mean? Yeah, it would no, be a lot more true. patriarchal. Uh, patriarch- no, patriotic. Patriarchal. <laughs> patriotic, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, that is true, <laughs> actually. Yeah, that's a I good think that's point. kind of a very 2019 sentiment for the good white character is now allowed to be ashamed of their country. We're like, again, is that productive? <laughs> I feel like that kind of conversation about shame I find kind of interesting because how much does that help anyone to... And not that the shame isn't good, maybe, but it's maybe a good first step. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's sort of like a kind of like virtue, like she's like virtuous because she's ashamed. She's the good one because she feels this shame. But yeah, yeah, she's always like this kind of perfect motherly, good figure, good Christian figure. And she isn't really, again, a bit like with Beth in the 2019 version, she is the kind of moral support for other characters and isn't really given the space to kind of be her own character that much to have those kind of complexities. Whereas in the 90s version, she's like a lot more like pragmatic she feels a lot more real to me in the 90s version as a real person that would exist somewhere. Yeah. And I feel like the 2019 version to me feels more like a character rather than a person. Yes. Yeah. Especially again with the scene when Meg talks to her mother in the 90s version about, and you don't mind that John is poor. And she just responds with, well, I'd rather he have a house. I just love that line because she just almost laughs a little bit when she says it because she makes it very clear to her girls, like, I don't care who you marry. But also as someone who has four kids and a husband who's all fighting a war, it's useful to maybe have a roof over your head plus income to feed the people under that roof. I love that because it didn't feel preachy to me, that line. It generally just felt like a mother being like, well, this is necessary, though, to get married. You can absolutely marry whoever you want, but there's basics that need to be covered Yeah, definitely. in life in general. Definitely. Yeah, and I feel like in the 2019 version, we're kind of not 
There are sort of hints towards Mami having this alter, not even alter ego, but sort of like in hidden depths of like yeah. emotion and frustration that are hinted towards, but mainly told to us and never really shown or not enough. It's really interesting because we both thought that the scene did not exist. And then we both figured out like quite recently that the scene does exist because even the scene where she talks to Joe, where she says, I'm angry nearly every day of my life, 40 years of effort for the anger not to get the better of me. And it's interesting because even that scene doesn't feel like it's about Marmy. It feels like it's about Joe not to let anger sort of... Because she says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. It's more about like teaching Joe to be controlling herself rather than yeah that. Yeah. And it feels almost sad as well. I kind of want, like, Marmy, why shouldn't you be allowed to express your anger? Because it's also kind of frustration at your place in the world and these things that are, like, difficult and you can't change. Or maybe you can change them, but maybe only if you're angry. And, it, like, this anger has been suppressed in Marmy so much that, like, you barely see it in the film. You really barely see it. Obviously, you want Joe to be happy. And, like, by the end of the film, she is happy, but not because she's had to suppress her anger, but because she's found different ways of living in the world. But this idea that she should suppress, like her frustrations and like minimize herself because it's what's expected and what she like needs to do to fulfill this role as mother is quite sad and just like quite depressing yeah um, and the 2019 version gives you hints of her anger yeah. and one of the ones that i completely missed was in the very beginning when you see marmy walk up to the house she wipes away a tear and then puts a smile on her face and asks the girls to give up their breakfast, which is a scene I completely forgot about until I rewatched it. The thing is, that still doesn't feel like enough to me. I feel like, firstly, she's sort of like, her emotion there is this sadness that the Hummels are in this like difficult state. Or, I mean, potentially, we, we don't know exactly what she's thinking. So it's like, mm -hmm. uh, probably like some empathy for the Hummels. Perhaps she's sad that she's going to have to ask her like daughters to give up their breakfast and that she perhaps she's upset that she can't provide for them in the way that she wants to and they can't have this perfect breakfast and look that she can see that they're all so happy and smiling and excited about Christmas, but it can't be the Christmas that she wants to give them. And it's like Christmas without their father. Potentially like so many things are going on, but like it kind of still reads as, you know, she's the good mother figure caring about others. Like this isn't really about it's her struggle, but it's always to do with how it's her struggle, like involved like in relation to her children and in relation to supporting others and so it still kind of feels like yeah it's about that supporting role and then also it just i don't know it just doesn't quite ring tr like i feel maybe we would have remembered it more if we would have if it was more impactful yeah and it's like she's presented as like so perfect with controlling her like she's still able to control her anger and all her frustration and even when she's like oh joe like you know i'm angry all the time she's presented as so perfect that it, it still feels kind of ingenuine i guess the thing that i would like to see more is her anger i think that's why yes. the moment when she talks to her husband is so much more satisfying to see maybe that's the character trait that i want to see more is the anger because when she says it took 40 years of effort that's horrible that's 40 years of suppressing an emotion that you have which is not irrational to have. Mm -hmm. You have four kids that you don't have enough money to feed. You have a giant house to take care of. You have this sunny disposition for everybody else all the time. And you have a husband who doesn't seem to be dealing in reality for most of it. And you don't really have enough support either. And you're not supposed to ask for help. And the fact that she just only ever for very brief moments gets to have that anger, I think that that's not a good thing. I just really want a scene there. We talked about this with Megan, uh, with Meg, <laughs> Megan, uh, with Meg. You can give a character like that a very short scene where you still show quite a lot of emotion, but you could show her somehow suppressing like a short scene where she just lets out her frustration on, I don't know, a piece of furniture or something because she's just very angry and just give you that depiction of it because even in her grief for Beth, she just cares more about Joe figuring out how to be happy and you just... Mm. Yeah. yeah, and there's one scene when uh, Bear has come to their house and they're having dinner on the table and he's like, oh, I'm probably going to go to California because <laughs> they're like, nice to immigrants in California. And then Mr. March is like, oh, perhaps I should go to California. And then Mommy's like, well, you're not an immigrant, so perhaps you should just stay here. And you kind of almost feel <laughs> the anger behind those words, and it's kind of played for laughs, but also you're just like, like, ouch, like, <laughs> this guy's been away at war for how many, a few years. She's been struggling on her own for all of this time. 
and like no wonder like yeah jesus christ dude don't like you can kind of understand her anger behind that he doesn't seem like a very responsible provider yeah exactly and that's kind of the one moment where you get this hint of this anger of just don't do not leave me on my own no like Mm -hmm. and you're also and i was just like (laughs) yeah mommy i'm exactly with you like this what is this dude doing what is he saying that's not funny that's just annoying and just please do not say this don't even choke about it it's Um, kind of like don't don't even (laughs) don't even joke about it don't even go there I just wish they would have given her more um, space to express that anger. Mm-hmm. I feel like the series does a little bit more in terms of Mr. March showing him as a little bit unreasonable. But again, Marmy just doesn't get enough to do in that aspect of it. She's just there to be selfless and good and Christian and caring. And she just needs to be... Again, even in that small scene between her and Aunt March where they talk about the fact that... Because Aunt March loves bringing up the fact that the dumbest thing that Marmy ever did was marry... Um, her husband yeah if you just had more scenes between the two of them where they just talk reality i feel Anne march would be the kind of character where marmy would be able to both break down a little bit but also then have Anne march be sort of because she's not a nice person also be like well and now you're done care like stop crying that kind of scene i think would really help in showing marmy as more of being allowed to not be good all the time Mm -hmm. and not having to sort of suppress her real nature as much because I don't think it's wrong to be angry, especially in that situation. And especially suppressing it is not a great idea either. Yeah. And I think it would be interesting to see what having to suppress that anger because of the circumstances does to a person as well. Being like, I understand why you've had to do this, but what impact has that had on you? Yeah, that would be really interesting to see. Yeah.